On their website, the Operator Foundation states, Operator makes usable tools to help people around the world with censorship, security, and privacy. Recently, Operator President Brandon Wiley spoke about the future of Internet freedom at the monthly meeting of EFF Austin. Dr. Brandon Wiley is our speaker tonight. Dr. Wiley is president of Operator Foundation, a nonprofit founded to promote, similar to EFF Austin, by the way, founded to promote internet freedom, open communication, and global internet security through technology development, deployment, and education. So Brandon's going to talk tonight about the future of internet freedom, why it will fail, and how we will save it. And I really hope we do save it. Brandon. All right. Hey. Uh, yeah, thanks everybody, uh, you know, for coming out tonight and thanks for EFF Austin. They've been a big supporter um, of internet freedom in general and of, you know, of the Operator Foundation, my organization uh, specifically, giving us a booth at their South by Southwest party and stuff to like let us, you know, tell people about the organization and, and do fundraising and stuff. Um, yeah, so just a little bit about me to just kind of, you know, give you some credibility so that you'll listen to the rest of my talk. Uh, my name is Dr. Brandon Wiley. I have a PhD in information studies. I know that sounds like a fake degree, but it's, it's real. It's a real degree. Same as every other PhD. It's from here at, at UT. Um, uh, yeah, I was a Jigsaw Research Fellow. It used to be called Google Ideas. That's Google's uh, like think tank uh, technology incubator sort of uh, program. Uh, I'm the president of the Operator Foundation, which is a nonprofit um, that I started uh, here in town. And um, you know, some of my past, if you know, people are in the space and know about like inter free internet freedom stuff, I worked on some uh, things that you might have known from like the 90s or the 2000s, like Freenet and BitTorrent. And uh, we do a lot of work with uh, Tor, which is a big uh, internet um, censorship convention tool. And uh, dust. That was my that's my dissertation. So you know, I've been, I've been around. It's not my first time at the rodeo. Um, been around, you know, working on projects for a while. Um, so, so yeah. So in, in 2014, um, we founded this uh, nonprofit, the Operator Foundation, and the idea is that we're going to make usable tools, like usability centric, like usability first. Because if people don't use the tools, then it doesn't matter how secure they are. So we're going to focus on usability, and we're going to try to fight censorship. We're going to try to increase security, and we're going to try to protect people's privacy through these tools um, that we develop. And we are a, a 501c3 uh, tax-exempt nonprofit. Um, so we're not like you know like an internet startup. Uh, we get donations, and then we use it to give the technology away to people for free. Um, and so you know our philosophy is we got three parts. One, technology. We develop technology. We make apps. We make hardware. We don't just recommend, you know, existing open source tools to people. We actually make the technology. Uh, and two is design. Like everything is designed to be usable. That's like the number one thing. Uh, and then people. Like anytime we're gonna make something, we first go to the people that are gonna use it and we say, hey, you know, do you have any problems? Uh, can we think of a technological solution? There's not always a technological solution. A lot of problems are. Uh, social problems, they're like problems that are caused by like government, you know, regulations and laws and things, and so we can't help with that. But if, you know, there's a solution that can be done with an app or with some hardware, then we make it and then we bring it back to the people and we say, hey, is this what you needed? Uh, we don't just sit around, you know, like in our office, like coming up with ideas that sound cool and that don't actually work in the field. Everything is, is tested in the field. And, uh, you know, it's not just me, we have a lot of people. Um, you know, on the board that are working, that are volunteering their time to, to work on this. And uh, then also we have, you know, a lot of different, uh, you know, people on staff that, uh, that help us do everything. So that's uh, Adelita. She, uh, she actually does, she's the software engineer. She does all the coding. And then Melissa does all the grant management. So, you know, my job, you know, is essentially I get to come talk to everybody and tell them all the great work we're doing. And then, you know, also kind of come up with some of the ideas and design the stuff. But we got a lot of people behind the scenes that are making all of this stuff work. Um, so this talk is going to be about internet freedom. We actually work on a lot of different things, but internet freedom is like one of the things that we do like the most work on. And uh, you you may be surprised when I tell you you know what our definition of internet freedom is. It's actually it's a it's kind of a, a technical term. It's like a term of art. Um, there's uh, like the internet freedom festival that happens every year. So there's a lot of people that would say that they work in the internet freedom space. 
Um, and so when I'm using the term, it may not be you know, what you expect. So first of all, for me, internet freedom, I'm talking about on a global level, right? So we, uh, you know, in the context of the US, we think a lot about things like uh, net neutrality and things like that. And, um, you know, that's very cool. Obviously, you know, I'm here at the EFF Austin event. I'm very pro net neutrality. Um, but uh, what we work with in the Operator Foundation is all of the rest of the world where their internet uh, situation is actually like a lot worse than the US. Because in the US, we're fortunate enough to have the First Amendment. Uh, and that's something that other countries don't generally have. And we also have a constitutionally based uh, law system where violating the First Amendment actually will you know, cause problems. And in a lot of other countries, there's, there's nothing even like uh, freedom of speech. So their internet is, uh, a lot of times when I talk to people from the US, they're really shocked how bad the internet conditions are in other countries. And I'm not talking about here just the connectivity, but just like what, um, like what you're allowed to do uh, on the internet. Um, so, so I define you know, internet freedom as having access to credible and reliable information, just about the normal things that you want to do, right? Like you want to get on the internet because you have a question or you want to know what's going on in the world. Um, can you access that information? Can you access information which is uh, true? And can you access information which is you know, relevant to your needs? And that seems, you know, in the US is like, oh, we have like maybe too much access to information. You know, like we have access to information that we don't even know what to believe anymore um, because there's just so much, you know, stuff out there. So in other countries, um, they have a problem that a lot of websites are blocked. So like in a lot of countries, Facebook is blocked, YouTube is blocked, uh, Gmail, uh, Google, um, anything which is uh, at all critical to the, to the local government will often be blocked. And then additionally, any tools that might allow you to access those websites like a VPN or something like Tor, which is, you know, allows you to circumvent the the blocking that's going on, those are also not allowed. And then also any kind of tool which allows free communication, so like a lot of chat applications, so like WhatsApp, Telegram, Signal, Facebook Messenger, anything that allows you to freely communicate with people, Skype is another thing that's blocked in a lot of countries, that will be blocked because it allows this free flow of information. And in those countries, what they want to do is uh, essentially um, allow only state controlled information. So only state controlled uh, newspapers are allowed to exist. If you have a newspaper and you say something critical about the government, then you no longer have a newspaper. All of the like TV news is controlled by the government. So the internet, you know, is kind of a place that people go for free information, which is why the internet is in these places, you know, largely very filtered. So there's a lot of reasons that um, free access you know, to credible and reliable information is important. There's a lot of like humanitarian reasons that this is important. So for instance, you know, on the top of the list <laughs> is uh, human rights. When human rights abuses are gonna happen in a country, one of the first things that they do is they will kick out all of the foreign journalists uh, and then they will block access to the internet so that people can't talk about the human rights abuses that are happening, right? Another thing that happens uh, a lot that's been happening more and more recently is if you're gonna do some election fraud, if you're gonna say, have the president for life be reelected and like 99% of people vote for the same person that they always vote for, um, they'll turn the internet off in the, in the whole country so that um, people can't do any kind of election monitoring because they don't have the connectivity they would need to be able to do that. Um, and so, yeah, so there's a lot of reasons um, that free information access is important. Um, and I want to talk a little bit, just because, you know, this EFF Austin event about the history of why we think of the internet as a place that we can find, uh, you know, like credible and reliable information. And this comes uh, back to like the history of when the, the EFF was started. Um, so like John Perry Barlow, who was one of the founders of the EFF, uh, also wrote this uh, document in the 90s called the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace, and it was very influential like to people's <laughs> thinking. And uh, you know, it's just this very poetic, you know, it says, governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you uh, of the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome among us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. It's like, oh, that's just, you know, uplifting, uplifting words. Um, you know, but is it, uh, you know, is it accurate? Uh, and so I think like an, an even better, you know, example of kind of this thinking was uh, from this, uh, the Hacker Manifesto, uh, which was around the same time, uh, where he says, this is our world now, the world of the electron on the switch, 
the beauty of the bod. We exist without nationality, skin color, or religious bias. That was our idea in the 90s of the internet. It seems a little bit naive now to think of the internet as a place that's free of any type of uh, nationality or, or bias, you know? Uh, but at the time, that was, that was the idea. Is like, we don't need to be tied to our bodies. Like, we're going to have this place which is going to be like pure uh, information. And uh, so there's this idea in 90s internet theory of what they call the temporary autonomous zone, which is a place um, that's created between the established regions where um, temporarily, like, there's it's kind of anarchy, right? Like, you can have, like, freedom temporarily. But as soon as you try to delineate, as soon as you try to, like, talk about it, then it no longer becomes that's why it's called the temporary autonomous zone. It goes away. And so we're far beyond the temporary autonomous zone phase of the internet, right? Like, it's no longer this thing that, like, only a few people know about, and you can get on there, and, like, governments aren't trying to, like, regulate what you're saying and stuff. Um, so, you know, so next thing I want to talk about is, okay, so internet freedom. We had all of these great ideas about how the internet was going to be this free place in the 90s, and now, you know, it's 2018. Um, why is it, you know, why is it not working out? And uh, it turns out that we made one little cognitive error in the way that we model what the internet is and how it works. And that is that the internet is physical. It is not a conceptual thing. It's a conceptual thing that actually has physical roots. So the way that the internet works, and a lot of people are surprised to find this out, is that there are, there are wires. It's just made of wires. A lot of people think that like, you know, our, it's wireless, right? But it's only wireless to the router, and then the router is plugged into some wires. Your cell phone goes to a cell tower, which then has some wires. Uh, a lot of the wires are on telephone poles, and then a lot of them are also buried underground. Um, and that's the internet. It's just a big collection of wires. And the reason is because transmitting electricity through uh, a wire is a lot more efficient, and you can go a lot farther uh, and a lot faster than doing it through air. So if you want to transmit electromagnetic waves through air, it's very just expensive and, um, you know, so wires are just more efficient. Um, so this is a picture of, uh, so how do we, you know, get internet in between continents is there's a wire, there's just a cable that goes across the bottom of the ocean. And that's, this is a map of all of the different internet cables. So like if you see, you know, like if you see up here, they've only got one, they've only got one cable. If that gets cut by, and this happens all the time, boat anchors just dra dragging through international waters, they don't pay attention to where the cables are and they'll cut that. No internet, that's it. And so, you know, here we got, you know, like over to Europe, we got a bunch, but still they get cut. They get cut all the time. And it's a, it's a real problem because that's how the internet and, uh, works. So here's actually a picture of the internet. <laughs> like this is it, this is the cable. It's not even that big. It's not even that big of a cable. Um, okay, so why is this problematic that the internet is a physical thing? So in addition to the fact that anybody can just cut the cables, which happens all the time and is a real problem, um, the, way that, the way that the internet works is that you have all the cables coming into a room and then they're all plugged together, right? So like if, you know, like I'm on T-Mobile and you're on AT&T, T-Mobile and AT&T both own wires, and those wires go into a room where they get all connected together. And they say, okay, T-Mobile traffic, we're gonna send to AT&T, at and traffic, we're gonna send to T-Mobile. And that's why it's called the internet, is because it's a bunch of networks, separately owned networks that are all connected together. And they're connected together in these rooms, which are called a point of presence. So for instance, on each uh, you know, place where that cable from the ocean lands, there's a room you know, there on the coast that hooks it up to that country's like, you know, local internet providers, right? And so the problem with this, with this like, you know, kind of centralized, like there's only so many of these rooms in the world, is that you can have somebody just sit there and look at all the traffic. And they can just say, okay, who's trying to access Facebook? Not today. And then <laughs> there you go, right? And so we think of the internet as being this decentralized, you know, like anarchic thing. And that's just not really, um, how it exists in its physical structure. It's, it's, you know, it's very hierarchical. So in some countries, you'll have um, all of the internet traffic of the entire country going through like one building, like one data center, where you've got people looking at all of it and deciding what to allow and what not to allow. Um, now, for efficiency reasons, uh, they don't actually use people. Uh, oh, wait, no, we're not to that yet. Sorry, we'll get to that. Okay, so, uh, right, the other thing we're going to talk about, internet shutdowns. Uh, and a lot of people, when I talk to them, Americans, uh, cannot believe that this is, like, really how it works. But in a lot of countries, they will just turn off 
the whole internet for the whole country. Um, there's this website, Access Now's Keep It On campaign, where they talk about, they track internet shutdowns. Um, and uh, so usually they're like from 24 to 72 hours. There's, they happen for different reasons. Sometimes they happen because um, it's like reactive. So like if there's protests against the government, they'll say, we're gonna shut off the internet because you've been bad and we're mad at you. Sometimes it's preemptive. Like if they're gonna do election fraud, they'll shut off the internet during the election. Um, India has had in this year, 2018, which is not even over yet, last time I checked 52 internet shutdowns in various states of India. So they'll, for the whole state, they'll turn it down. Uh, one of the things, reasons they've been doing it in India, or so they, so they say, so the official reason is, is that they have these um, like exams like that everyone takes. If you want to be in the civil service, you have to take this exam. It's a big deal. And they don't want people to cheat. So they just turn off the whole internet for two <laughs> weeks so no one can cheat on the exam. Now, what happens to all the people that need the internet for other reasons other than cheating on exams? Well, they also don't have the internet because they turned off the whole thing. So, um, you know, it's a problem. It's a big, it's a big problem. Um, right, okay, great. So, internet freedom, how are we gonna save it? Well, that's what we do at the Operator Foundation. That's our whole mission is to, um, to save the internet so that everybody can get access to that credible and relevant information. Um, right, so, Essentially, this is, this is like a conceptual model of how internet filtering rocks, right, works, right? You have somebody there and they're looking at the internet. And the cats here, cat pictures, represent all of the good things on the internet that we love, that we want, that we need, but that the man does not want you to have. They don't want you looking at cat pictures. You know, that could be access to like healthcare information, election results, whatever, right? That's the good stuff. And then we got bananas here, just irrelevant stuff. Like they don't, it's not like they only let you look at certain things. They only block certain things and everything else, everything that's irrelevant is allowed through, right? So, you know, basically that's it. You got somebody, they're like, is it a cat picture or not? Is it a cat picture or not, right? That's what they're, that's what they're doing. For efficiency reasons, they don't use people though, is the thing. They use robots, right? So that are trained by people that because you gotta look at all the internet traffic for the entire country simultaneously, right? Imagine all the people streaming Netflix in your country, like simultaneously, you gotta look at all of it and be like, uh, what are they watching, you know? So, uh, so they train these robots. And so that is what gives us a way to be able to defeat the internet censorship, right? Because we don't actually have to fool a person, we have to fool a robot that was chained, like a, you know, not even an AI, AI is stretching it. Like if you knew how this technology works, you would be shocked how uh, bad it is at matching what the, what the bad traffic is or whatever, right? So all we have to do is we have to take the traffic that they're trying to block and just dress it up so it looks like the traffic which is allowed through, right? So that's it, that's it, that's all we have to do. <laughs> we dress up the cats like bananas, they fool the robots and then we get them through. And that is you know, what I did my dissertation on and that is we, what we spend a lot of time doing uh, at the Operator Foundation. The very, you know, the details, the technical details, it's like how, how deep do you want to go? I could talk for two hours just on the technical details of how the filtering things work and how we defeat them. Um, so I got you guys some, you know, some follow-up reading if you want. So Operator Foundation has a project called Shapeshifter, which you can put in any application. If you're an application developer, you put it in your application and then your application does not get blocked in these countries that are trying to block your application, right? So if you have like a chat application or like a VPN, you can put our technology, it's free, it's open source uh, that we're, we're making it for. Um, there's a specification on how to write these, um, like these things that hide your traffic. Uh, it's called the pluggable transport specification. And that's something that we worked on. We worked on that specification with a bunch of different internet freedom tools like VPNs and, and uh, censorship circumvention tools and stuff. We wrote to make this thing where essentially anybody, any researcher that comes up with a new cool idea on how to hide your traffic can uh, just make it as a little module and you can pop it in and then you can start using that. Because it changes all the time. Like the, what people block and how they block it changes all the time. So we need, there's an active area of research on different ways to hide your traffic. Um, so like just as an example of one of these things, there was one of the early papers in the field is called Skype Morph and it makes whatever you're doing looks like you're having like a Skype video call, right? That's an example of the sort of thing that people do. And then um, there's, uh, I gave a talk at DEF CON, which is a great 
hacker conference. Just it just happened. Um, it happens in the summertime in Las Vegas. So I gave a talk called "Defeating Internet Censorship with Dutch: The Polymorphic Protocol Engine." And then also I have my PhD dissertation, "Circuiting Network Filtering with Polymorphic Protocol Shapeshifting." I know it's like so long. That's why I put it on the slide so that you can, you know, you can look it up later. Um, so you know, if you really want to get, there's like charts and everything. If you want to get into the nitty gritty, um, then you can like, you know, read about that. Um, okay, so what about internet shutdowns? So unfortunately, like changing your traffic to disguise it doesn't work if there's no internet at all. We need like a totally different solution for the situation in which there's no internet at all. And so, um, so that's when the hardware comes out. So I got some of my little hardware devices here for everybody to check out. So this is, um, right, so this is what we call the Emergency Data Exchange Network, or EDEN is like an acronym because everybody loves acronyms in the grant-funded world. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, we have three different models of this. And so normally we don't talk about like unfunded projects. This is just, this is a prototype just for everybody here in the room to check out because um, we're hoping to get funding for this soon. Uh, and I just want to talk about kind of the concept behind it. So um, this is uh, Arduino compatible. I don't know if you guys know Arduino. It's like a, a very inexpensive computer that you can program, just like plug it into your computer with USB and you can program it. Everything's free, everything's open source. So this is our Arduino compatible computer in here and a little 3D printed case. And then what it has inside of it is has this uh, like a little processor and that it has this, and this is the key to our technology is there's this new radio protocol called LoRa, which stands for long range, which allows us to get two kilometers of range just with this device, just with this antenna. You don't need any fancy like satellite dish type antennas and stuff like just with this little shorty one, you can get two kilometers. Um, and so what we have developed with this is it's essentially like a peer-to-peer -peer text messaging. So you connect to it on your phone and then you can send messages back and forth. And the key, you know, about this as compared to what other people have been trying to do in the space is that it is a uh, low bandwidth, um, you know, low power sort of thing. So it's not like a Wi-Fi, you can't watch YouTube on it. It's just for when the internet for the whole country goes out, you can send text messages back and forth so that you can coordinate, you know, like protecting against human rights abuses, doing election monitoring, stuff like that. And then we have another kind of uh, versions of this in uh, development. We have this one, um, that uh, allows voice communication. There's this great open source voice compression protocol called Codec 2 that um, allows you to get um, half a second of audio in each little transmission that we do. And the cool thing about the technology we're building with this is that um, you can make any one of these to make a, a repeater. A repeater is something that basically like takes your traffic and then repeats it so that you can double the range, right? So I could put one of these, you know, on the top of Capital Factory here, and then anybody that could see it anywhere in town could kind of bounce through it. So this is not like your typical, um, like, uh, you know, like, a, yeah, not like a Uno. It's not like one of those 8-bit Arduino processors. This is actually a 32-bit processor. So the, the LoRa protocol is a low bandwidth protocol that has a long distance. And so you could use a different radio and then you could get something that's shorter range and higher bandwidth. But um, the reason we're using the lower protocol is because we're able to, the idea here is you know, you're in a, you're in a city and you gotta coordinate over like the whole city when, when, the, uh, when the internet is down. So, um, and, uh, what did you do? oh yeah, oh I have uh, just the little parts if anybody wants to look at it. So a cool thing about the way we're doing this is these are commodity parts. These are from Adafruit in New York. So, um, these are open source hardware. And so this is the little processor here. It's got like a little Wi-Fi access point so you can talk to it from your phone. Uh, this is the little radio with the, with the LoRa chip on there. Antenna goes on there and then that's it. And you just pop them together and uh, then you're ready to go. So you can order these parts um, internationally. Like you don't have to get them from us. You can just get them from Adafruit's international distributors. And then what we provide is the design and the case and the, uh, the operating system that allows you to do the text messaging and all that. So these, at a, on, a, on a one unit at a time basis, cost about $100. And the next version, the next thing I'm gonna talk about is, is 300. So we also have a satellite bridge. And this is a very exciting feature. We use the Iridium satellite network it, uh, that works anywhere in the world, even in the ocean, even on the poles. And, um, and it meshes with the text messaging. So like if you can see like if I put the satellite link up on top of the building, anybody that's within range can bounce through it and access the satellite. Um, and uh, yeah, and it meshes with the text messaging. So actually, when you send something through the satellite, the, a person some, in some other country just gets a text on their phone 
and they text you back, and it goes through the text network into our servers and then back through the satellite network. So it, it looks to other people like you actually have texting coverage, even though you're in a country that has no mobile phone connectivity at all because they've, they've turned the whole thing off, right? So it's kind of like a, I just be like a seamless experience. The, the key to our technology is that it is very low bandwidth. So like uh, multimedia would not be like, even sending images would just be like too much, too much bandwidth and it would be too, it would be too expensive. Um, so, you know, that's why we call it the emergency data exchange network, because this is something it's only designed to be used when your normal internet is out, and so you have no other option, right? When the normal internet comes back on, you want to switch to that so you can, you know, watch YouTube and stuff like that. So, uh, we would love to do end to end uh, encryption. We do a lot of stuff, we work within encryption a lot. Uh, unfortunately, you, there's no end-to-end -end encryption on SMS text messages. So if you want to be able to bridge to the normal SMS text messaging network and be able to send and receive texts with people that do not have any special sort of software installed, then there's no way to do end-to-end uh, -end encrypted messaging. And some people in the past have um, kind of had something where it was like a hybrid, like when you're sending messages to people on SMS, it's not encrypted. And when you're sending messages to people that have the app, it is encrypted. And we find that's like a very confusing experience. Like they don't know, users don't know if things are or are not encrypted. Um, a lot of people used to think that Iridium was encrypted. And there's a great, there's a great CCC, it's like a German hacker conference. There's a great talk where they managed to figure out how to decode Iridium text messages. Um, and like show a bunch of messages that people have been sending that they thought it was <coughs> encrypted. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so there's no encryption anywhere, but we have all of the um, technology like that we can run on the chip to do end-to-end -end encryption. So if we find that there is an opportunity to do it down the road, it would be easy to turn on. The only reason we're not doing it is compatibility and usability. So we're not actually using SMS at, like at all in the Eden system. So it's it's peer to peer using this LoRa protocol, and then it's through Iridium using the Iridium protocol. And when you go through the satellite through Iridium, we have a bridge that bridge to bridges to the normal SMS text messaging system. It bridges back and forth, right? So it's yeah, it would be in the case that you want to have this compatibility with the SMS texting for like people. Like the idea is like so you're in the country with no with no connectivity, you want to text out to people that are in another country that have a normal cell phone. That's, that's the compatibility idea, right? If we gave up that idea, if we were like saying like only people with Eden devices can text other people with Eden devices, then absolutely we could do end encryption. That would be no problem. The idea is that you're gonna wanna text people that just have a normal phone because uh, you know, that's like, you wanna reach out to people in other countries. Like you wanna talk to journalists, you wanna talk to people that have information and stuff. Now for the satellite stuff, you do need, uh, cause of the way Iridium satellite works, for the satellite stuff, you do need like a subscription to a satellite service and you do need to like set up your billing and everything for that. So our, our model generally is like, we don't provide services, we provide technology, we provide designs and then we provide like the software and everything. So, um, we work with partners, we work with nonprofits in each individual country that have access to the actual user base. So um, were we to actually deploy this, we would work with the partners and they would do all the provisioning locally for their user base and they would set up all the billing and everything. Um, nobody would be paying us, right? Because we're a nonprofit, uh, we get grant money, we make things and then we give it, we give it to people. Provisioning is a, a big an issue. And a lot of this technology, like the LoRa technology comes from kind of the internet of things space and we're, kind of repurposing it for this emergency communication space. And they put a lot of thought in the Internet of Things space into provisioning, although I'm not sure that they really have the full the answer yet. Provisioning is hard, right? Getting like everybody set up on your network and making sure that, you know, like people that are on, like different groups of people that set up a communication network, like you don't want like cross talk between them and things like this. So, I mean, we've did a lot, we've done a lot of research in this space specifically. Uh, we've done a lot of research about how emergency communication organizations do their setup, right? Um, and so, um, yeah, anyway, there's a lot to talk about on the provisioning side, but we don't have it totally answered because it's just a prototype. Um, cool, so uh, 
Yeah, so the, I guess I talked about a lot of this, but the two things I want to mention is just that, uh, so when people, a lot of times when they try to do these like mesh networks and stuff, they're looking at stuff like 802.11, um, they're looking at things like uh, hikers and like concert goers and like these kind of like other use cases for alternative communication. So what we've really looked at is the emergency communication network. So that's people like, people that go into disaster areas, um, people like the Red Cross, uh, they have a whole different kind of way that they do their communication where essentially it's either like peer-to-peer -peer, like you can think like walkie-talkies right like I have a walkie-talkie you have a walkie-talkie we can communicate without you know like a cellular network and then they have these things called repeaters which are essentially just a radio that's like up on a hill or something so that I go to the radio and then to your walkie-talkie that way we can talk you know over a mountain my last point here is urban or urban deployment focus is that a lot of these devices that people make are, are for like countries that that don't have good internet connectivity at all ever. So they're like, people are focusing on like these like rugged outdoor solar powered, you know, sort of things. And that's not what we're working on. This is like, you're not gonna be using this for more than like two weeks. That would be the most, you know, one of the problems that we have for instance is like, um, so we want you to be able to access this via your, your phone to send text messages and stuff. However, um, we've decided to go with like a, a mobile web approach that's like hosted on the device with uh, like a hotspot because uh, if you want to actually have the users install an app, what we found in past situations is that users will not install an app before the internet shutdown occurs. Like you would think that they would think like, oh, you know, internet shutdowns occur regularly in my country, I should like prepare. And so like these uh, like different nonprofits that we work with, you know, they'll do all the preparation. But in terms of the end users, um, like, so essentially what emergency communication people do is they have a thing called like a radio cache, which is a building that you can go to when something happens and that all people have to know is like, well, when the internet goes down, I should go here and they'll like tell me what to do and give me instructions and right. Um, but, um, you know, in terms of, uh, yeah. So we need like some level of technical capacity to like be prepared, uh, not, on the, not on the end user side necessarily. I will explain the name of the of the company, uh, Operator Foundation. Um, so, in the olden on the olden days, when you had a wired telephone, uh, before we had touch tone dialing or or even rotary dialing, you would pick up the phone and the, there would be someone on the other end, which was the operator, and you would say, "Hello, operator, can you connect me to Chicago?" And then um, the operator would connect you to Chicago, and then you could talk to whoever you want to talk to. So that's what we do. We are the uh, the human element that helps people connect. Um, when they, you know, the technology doesn't work to let them connect. So, uh, thank you. Yes. So that's so that's the idea. And so the the logo is an O for operator, and then is also a rotary phone dial. I don't know if you've ever seen one of those. Let me tell you a fun story about net neutrality and uh, FCC regulation. So um, I used to work at BitTorrent. I don't know if anybody knows BitTorrent. It <laughs> it was an actual company. That's something a lot of people don't know about BitTorrent. Um, and so it was a thing you could download stuff and it was like faster and like more efficient than a normal download. And so I was working at this company and um, I don't know if anybody remembers, but uh, Comcast got into trouble with the FCC because they were, they were throttling BitTorrent connections. Like they were, uh, this was kind of a very early net neutrality case where they were saying, oh, if you're using BitTorrent, we're gonna like, we're gonna like stop it. And um, they got in trouble with FCC and they were fined and everything. So BitTorrent had a very good analytics uh, team. And so before uh, the FCC found out that this was happening, we at BitTorrent were like, hey, there's something happening on the Comcast network. We did you know, some forensics and we realized what Comcast was doing, that they were screwing with our traffic. So I was actually the person that BitTorrent sent to Comcast headquarters to try to talk some reason into them. Um, that, was, that was my job. I was, yeah, I was the uh, director of product management on the enterprise side. They were an enterprise, you know, hopeful, hopefully customer. So I went to Comcast and um, I, you know, I said to them, so, you know, we've, we've heard that BitTorrent is crushing your network. You don't have the bandwidth to keep up. And so you started throttling us. It's cool. We will give you some free technology that will make BitTorrent better on your network, faster, and save you all this bandwidth that you know, that we're using up all your bandwidth and it's, you're sad. And then they said, oh, no, 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 no. We don't have a bandwidth shortage. That's just what we tell the government so they don't regulate us. They let us self-regulate because we say like, oh no, we have to regulate or else our network will be crushed by all this internet downloading, right? So like when they talk about things about how, you know, the reason they have caps and stuff is because of these like greedy internet users that use too much bandwidth. That is just not how the internet works at all. Um, 
it's true that like if you were someone on your cell tower was like somehow using a lot of data, like maybe your cell tower, there's like too many people on your cell tower, it's clogged, but it's like it doesn't clog up the whole internet, right? Especially like across like Comcast, like entire service area, like they don't have any shortages, right? And the other reason that, you know, that they wanted to stop BitTorrent is, you know, the internet uh, companies and the cable companies have merged. So they don't want you to watch movies on the internet. They don't want you to watch Netflix. They want you, and this is what Comcast told me, like this is not interpretation. This is what they told me. We want you to like essentially like buy a movie and then like you're paying us like $20 for a gigabyte of data instead of like pennies for a gigabyte of data, right? Like we want you to buy ringtones. Like we want to not be a utility where internet like data is like water and it's just basically free. We want the price of data to go up. So we want you to buy stuff. So what they actually tried to do was they tried to buy our video store that we had. They're like, we liked the BitTorrent. There used to be like a BitTorrent video store. It's like a Netflix competitor. And Comcast was all like, yeah, we want that. We want a video store. Can we buy yours? And we're like, we're, that's not our business is to make like white label video stores. Like we want people to use BitTorrent, you know? And so they were all like, yeah, we're definitely not interested at all in doing anything with you. So, um, so yeah, so anyway, um, yeah. Uh, so if it wasn't for the FCC, there wouldn't have been any regulation. Like self-regulation leads to the sort of situations, you know, that happened in, in this story. But it's also artificial scarcity. Yes, artificial scarcity is a way to, you know, drive prices up. And I used to like on my blog, I have this blog, step3profit.com. I used to do every few years, um, I would track like how much does internet really cost you? Because as they keep changing the pricing, essentially what they're doing is raising the cost per gigabyte without making anything like faster or better. Like they just, you know, like they'll put, the, they'll move the caps and they'll change the, the bandwidth around and it just keeps, you know, going up. And that's, that's the whole plan. The whole plan is to make internet cost more so that they can, and I said to them, I said, don't you want to save on your costs? And they said to me, we're executives. We get paid on the amount of revenue that we generate not on the amount of like total profit. So what we want to do is we want our revenue to go up while we're in this executive position so we can get these big bonuses. That's our motivation. They were very candid with me. So uh, let's open it up to, um, to, to just general questions. Uh, I know there were a lot of interest in our internet shutdown devices, but we can also talk about you know general internet filtering and stuff. Yeah? My question real quick was, once you realized you didn't want to do anything, was there any retaliation on your side to try to make the packets look different so people couldn't distinguish the torn from other that's a great question that is a great question that is actually so that is not just my first net neutrality experience but that's my first experience with what they call uh in the industry deep packet inspection which was the technique that they were using to tell this is BitTorrent traffic uh previously um they didn't really have a way to do that like they could tell what site you were going to but they couldn't just be like all of this traffic is all BitTorrent even though it's going like all over the place. So um, that's actually how I got into this uh, anti-censorship stuff. And that's what my dissertation is based on is this deep packet inspection. So, um, so yeah, exact, that's exactly what we did was we just said, okay, how's their technology work? How are they detecting and blocking BitTorrent traffic? And then we designed an encryption layer for BitTorrent that hides the traffic. And that, as far as I know, still works today. Like um, BitTorrent is the most blocked protocol on the internet because a lot of people that make, a lot of the vendors just go ahead and include a BitTorrent detector, which is very old and out of date and doesn't work and just like have it on by default. And so BitTorrent is very highly blocked. But uh, if you click that encrypt your traffic uh, checkbox, then as far as I know, that still works like pretty much, pretty much everywhere. Um, yeah. Uh, it looks like we're almost out of time, but uh, no, just no, no, we got we plenty, plenty of time. <laughs> plenty of time. Uh, what are the projects that you guys are doing right now that you're most excited about? Oh, great question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, introducing my bonus slide. Um, so these are some of the stuff, things that we're working on right now. These are kind of like current projects. Um, so Moon Bounce is a project we did. So I don't know if anybody knows what a VPN is. A VPN is essentially a software that you turn it on and it connects you back to your like home network or office network. And then you can use that internet in order to 
access the internet. So if you travel across the world, you can connect back to like your home internet and, and you know, you can do things like um, watch video streams that, you know, aren't available in that country or, you know, just have all your data encrypted so that the government of the country you're in doesn't steal all your trade secrets. There's a <coughs> lot of good uses for VPNs. So Moonbounce was our example of this shapeshifter technology we make that hides your traffic and a VPN. So this is something that we want everybody to do that builds VPNs. So we made this example, but it's actually, you know, it's actually like a thing that you can download and that you can like play play around with. Um, and um, it's a big problem because in a lot of countries they're blocking all VPNs now. So if you're a traveler and you're you're traveling to these different countries, you can't get on any of the websites. I I had a friend that their whole company runs on like Google Drive apps, you know, like Google Docs and everything. And uh, in some countries there's no Google. So there's no Google Docs. And if you're there for work, uh, you can't send email through Gmail. You can't access any of your documents. It's really bad. So you need something like a VPN. And so Moonbounce is our example. And we hope to do some more work with that if we can get some more funding for it and just you know make it really good and easy to use. One of the cool things about Moonbounce, it's got this social aspect. You have to run like a server um, in order to bounce, bounce your traffic through it. But once you have it, you can share it using normal macOS sharing to all of your friends, and then they don't have to know anything about servers, right? They can just get your link and then you know, go and everybody, like you could basically set up a little uh, VPN server just like for your community. Um, so that's, I think, could be cool. Um, another thing for app developers is, um, so uh, I, uh, on iOS, Apple has really changed the way that you do any kind of uh, VPN or other like network, you know, integration. And so um, that's been really hard for people uh, like Tor that have like these existing apps. They don't work as well on iOS anymore because Apple changed everything around. So we have a couple of cool projects in that space. One is, so Apple wants everything to be written in their language, which is uh, called Swift. We have a pure Swift implementation of our uh, shapeshifter technology. So if you have an app that's for iOS or macOS, you could just take our open source code and put it directly in your app and have your, and have your app no longer blocked. And if you don't even want to modify your code, there's a new thing called a network extension for iOS where you can install our, you could kind of like side load our thing so that all of the traffic on your entire phone is going through our shapeshifter technology and you don't even need to modify your app. You just need to get people to install the network extension. So that's cool. And then um, OpenVPN is a very popular uh, open source VPN software. It's like, there's like a free open source version. A lot of people use it in the open source world. Uh, we've been actually working with OpenVPN to get our shapeshifter technology into OpenVPN. So we have our own fork right now. We're hoping to get it merged in so that everybody can have it. But if you use our fork, um, you know, you can have OpenVPN just right, you know, just baked in, has this technology to obfuscate the traffic. Uh, and then last thing is uh, postcard. Uh, I was mainly talking about internet freedom today. So we've been mainly talking about um, kind of this network stuff and like network protocol obfuscation and stuff. But we, we do other stuff, right? Like that's just what I was talking about today. So I really could not, you know, finish the talk without talking about Postcard. It's a project that we're really excited about and we're really proud of. And it's an encrypted email application that we designed for journalists in Mexico City. Um, that is a community that they have a lot of threats against their privacy. They have people like literally like stealing their laptops in order to get access to their confidential files, right? Um, they're using like essentially just kind of like normal chat apps to send documents back and forth, unencrypted chat and stuff like just normal SMS to send these confidential documents. They're doing things like, um, I'm gonna go to this place at this time. And it's like, they could be kidnapped and like sometimes, sometimes they are. Um, there's a lot of threats to their life and liberty um, to these journalists in Mexico City. Uh, so we said to them, you know, we did, we did this work, we did these like user studies with them. We said, well, why don't you use encrypted email? You know, like that would really be like so much better. And they understood there was a need and they were willing to make a change and like install some software. But when we tried to walk them through and setting up encrypted email, it was very demoralizing. They were like, listen, <laughs> I'm not going to use this. Like, this is too hard. I got to get the people I communicate with to do this whole same thing. It's going to be like, this is, this is too hard. So we designed an encrypted email solution for them like from scratch. It doesn't use any of the decades old technology that people use for encrypted email. It uses modern uh, encryption you know, uh, software and standards. And it's, it's designed to be in incredibly usable. So it's, it, it's, it looks to you like a social network. Like you add people, they add you back. Then you can send messages. 
uh, but in the back end, it's actually just using your email account and sending your public keys and uh, doing the encryption and doing the signatures. And there's no way in our app to ever send or receive an unencrypted message. There's essentially no way you can mess anything up. All you do is you install it and you add people and you just send it back for it. So we're very, but I take very proud of that. But as a consequence of that, you won't be able to send email to anyone who doesn't accept your friend request with the app. It's true but because, because you know a key exchange with that's them, right. So. Yeah. So with public key cryptography, you have to do a key exchange where you send them your key and then they send you their key. That's how the technology works. So, um, so yes. But if you think about it with this social network metaphor, you know, there are some things, there are some networks where like you can't communicate with people unless you do a mutual friend. Right. So um, I think that we found that like people seem to understand the metaphor better than they understand like words like public key cryptography. Mm -hmm. So like in our software, you never see these words, right? Like we just explained to you, this is a, a more secure way to communicate and it'll protect your privacy. And then here's what you do. And then we don't have all the, the jargon and everything. This is a project that, you know, we had funding and we did a, a couple of iterations. We, we first, we went to Mexico City. We talked to journalists who said, what are your problems? We decided encrypted email would probably be what they needed. We designed the app. We went down, we got some feedback. And now we, um, there's a little bit more usability that we need to do. So we're looking for like a final kind of grant to get it finished and shipped. We will not ship anything until it's ready because once we do, then we'll have users and then, you know, like we can't change the format and things like that. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, that's something we're definitely actively looking for a grant for uh, right now. With the low bandwidth communication, do you ever find yourself in a situation where you need to prioritize uh, different types of traffic? Yeah, and so that's actually one of the key features of emergency communication networks, as opposed to like more general kind of like Wi-Fi mesh or whatever. At emergency communication networks, you have um, this ability that if you have a, like an urgent message, if you have like the right um, administrative access to mark your message as urgent, you can stop all of the other traffic on the network and say, okay, everyone be quiet. Let's only care about this message and let's, um, you know, like make sure that it gets there and you can do things like receipt, you know, uh, you know, response and everything. And so, uh, so yeah, that's a key, that's a key feature. Um, especially like if you have repeaters. So like the thing, repeaters are great because like, you can't talk through a mountain, but if you have a repeater on the mountain, you can talk to the mountain and then back down the other side. Um, the problem with repeaters though, is that they double every message, right? So if you're using the repeater, it's like now your bandwidth is halved because half of the messages are sending and then half of the messages are repeating, right? So um, I think people have this idea that like, we should just like saturate everything with like mesh networks, but it's the opposite. Like you want the minimum number of points and you want the least people talking as possible. So that's one of the things with the traffic prioritization is you say, everyone stop transmitting for 10 minutes that way we can make sure this one message actually like gets to the repeater and then gets retransmitted. So in terms of other countries, it's very interesting. The way the filtering works, the way the blocking works in every country is slightly different. And there's a couple of reasons. One is they buy different equipment. And most countries don't manufacture and design their own equipment. Most buy it out of a few companies, mainly from California. There's like a few vendors um, that most that's what most people have and that's you know that's how it is with internet you know like routers and stuff right there's like a few big vendors and like most people most people have that stuff so um so we kind of um when we design our stuff we uh one of the things i did was i actually did an analysis of the popular hardware and how it works and what it specifically looks at in your internet traffic because there's a lot of these kind of academic um approaches where they'll they'll make some way to hide your traffic that would not really work very well when it was actually deployed because of the fact that the way the filtering hardware works is not looking at the part of your internet traffic that you're hiding, right? There's different ways to hide your traffic and the more extreme you go, the worse the performance is. And there's kind of a threshold where the performance gets so bad that the application that you're trying to use like no longer works. So when we design this stuff, we're trying to balance um, the level of obfuscation with the performance. And um, generally it's, it's pretty good. It's pretty good, I would say, um, on, most, on most networks. There's some networks where they do more aggressive type of filtering, where you have to do more aggressive obfuscation, where uh, I would say, for instance, like watching YouTube over an obfuscated link would maybe not work, like sure, live video and stuff. Like pretty much the amount of internet filtering is going up, the severity of internet filtering is going up, and the amount of internet shutdowns are going up. There was a time when people thought, nobody would ever block encrypted web traffic like HTTPS 
because that would um, cause like banking to not work and stuff. And there was an instance, uh, an instance where one country shut off all HTTPS traffic in the whole country because HTTPS, encrypted web, hides a lot of what you're doing just, just already. Um, and so they wanted people to switch. At the time, the way that the browsers worked, they would just switch to the unencrypted version if the encrypted version was blocked. Browsers don't work like that anymore, but that's how it worked at the time. So they essentially just got everyone to switch to the unencrypted stuff in the whole country by just blocking the encrypted stuff. Um, and, uh, no, and people thought, no, they would never do that. HTTPS is the one thing that will never be blocked because it, banking requires it. And uh, governments have gotten bolder and said, you know what, we don't care about banking. <laughs> you know, And internet shutdowns show that. Like, There's nothing worse you can do in terms of internet filtering than to shut off the whole internet. And people thought, oh, that would never happen. That's crazy. But it's happening um, you know, more and more. So yeah, I think there's an increasing need for protection, um, for security. And for privacy, and you know, and, and for censorship, pretty much any company that is operating in another country is following the laws of that country. And so, if they have some laws that say like you're not allowed to provide access to certain material, like if people search for this term, you must block it. Um, uh, that's what everybody you know does, right? So um, now we also follow all of the laws of the country. We don't encourage anyone to do anything illegal or help anyone do anything illegal either in the U.S. or where they are located. However, the way that blocking works is they don't generally pass a law that says you must block this protocol. Like you must block all VPNs. Like Facebook is not allowed. Uh, what they do is they buy the hardware, they install it, and they just go configure it and just block some things, right? And um, this is one of the big problems with the filtering, right? Is that there's no accountability, there's no like legislative thing. If your website gets blocked, there's no recourse for you to go and say, oh, I'm sorry you accidentally blocked me and please unblock me because I'm a great website. And there's no way to do that, right? Because it's just, it all happens in the data centers with the administrative people that are just told like, hey, you know, like we don't want stuff that's critical to the government, find websites that are critical to government and block them, right? And so, but the upshot of that is that in most countries, and it's not 100% of countries, uh, there are some where they have passed some laws that make certain tools illegal, but for the most part, it's not illegal to use any kind of circumvention technology, right? If you access Facebook, when Facebook is blocked, it's fine, nobody's gonna come to your house, you're not gonna go to jail in most countries, um, because they never passed the law to make it illegal, so it's you know it's fine. Um, yeah. Is it the countries, or could it be the network providers themselves? I saw websites that were not shown up on computers, but that could be pulled up by phone. Yeah. So um, generally, uh, blocking is done by individual network providers. It is the case that in some countries, there's only one network provider for the whole country, which is owned by the government. And in other cases, there are multiple providers, but they're all uh, operating with a license from the government. So if the government says you must block this, they generally have to comply or they will lose their license to do business. And then, so, so generally everybody complies, right? Like if somebody says block this website, it's gonna get blocked. There's, there's really no, uh, there's really no uh, recourse. But yeah, it is by, by provider. So depending on if you're in a big country that has a lot of internet, depending on where you are in the country, you'll be exiting through a different provider. And the blocking, the filtering does uh, vary, you know, depending on where you are, yeah. Um, but it also depends on where the website is hosted, because I came across where I could have it hosted out of different areas within Europe or the States. So what should I do? Should uh, I have it hosted out of here then, to be on the safe side? Or oh yeah, that, cheaper somewhere else? that's a great question. Yeah, so, so it doesn't matter where it's hosted, because um, two things. One, you know, there's the path that your internet connection takes from where your computer is to where the website is. And so it, it travels over different cables depending on you know, like what path it needs to take. Now in some countries, all of the traffic for the whole country is going through one data center, in which case it doesn't matter where it's hosted. But in other cases, you're gonna go through different exit points depending on where it's hosted. The other thing is that um, the place where you're hosting the website, they can also be told to take down your website. Um, and so, um, there are people that were not able to host websites in country, and so they ended up hosting them in the U.S. Um, and that, you know, that's that's a very popular thing is like not hosting content that the government will not allow in that country, but to instead host it in another country. Yeah, Your yeah. Question, can you host websites in clouds yet? Can you host websites in the cloud? Yes, most websites are hosted in some kind of cloud hosting I mean, now. It's very popular. Found to be locations 
Not bound to it. Yeah, so that's, there was a technology that I used to work on. Uh, Freenet was actually one of my early projects in like 98 um, through like 2002 that was based on that uh, kind of idea of like let's host websites not in any one <coughs> particular place so people can't take them down. Um, and that was, uh, I think, uh, very relevant back then because the way that people would attack content is they would, um, they would take the website down, right? And that was, that was the attack. And since the attacks have now kind of evolved so that instead of it being taking the website down because you can move the website to a country where they won't take it down, you can find a provider that won't take it down. Um, the attack now is not letting people in the country access the website, right? And so that's why we're working on this uh, shapeshifter technology is it's a, you know, it's an, it's a new attack um, that uh, also blocks websites, right? It has the same effect even though it's a different, uh, different attack. But yeah, that's an interesting question, yeah. So there's a whole bunch of other technologies besides Iridium showing up, right? So there's multiple people trying to put up satellites. There's people like Google that have at least thought about playing with balloons mm -hmm. and other people talking about it, like Facebook has a conversation. How are those things going to uh, interact with what you're working on? Yeah, so we've looked at all of these different um, options for deploying um, internet um, to people that are having internet shut down. And, um, I think the great thing about using the Iridium satellite network, the reason I think it's the best option is because it works everywhere in the world. Um, the thing with the balloons, right, is you have to launch the balloons and they need, you have to have one of the balloons. So the way the balloon so internet like works is... Like uh, a repeater on a mountain kind of thing. Yeah, so but the balloon internet actually, the, they're high altitude, so they, they launch them and then they circle the world. Um, so they're kind of like low satellites. So for the balloon internet to work like, you need to have a balloon in range, which it's kind of random whether or not it is. So those are more kind of designed for, um, you know, like when a balloon's in range, I'll like send some data and I'll get some data back. But like in the in the moment, like you know, like we have a like a 24-hour outage and we need the internet now, uh, it doesn't work so well. Um, something else we've looked at um, is a laser internet. Um, so essentially, the LoRa stuff works in country. Uh, to like blanket the city and get all your communication. And then what we use Iridium for is the out of country. Like you want to hop the border to a place that has internet so you can communicate with the outside world, right? And um, so uh, the downside, I think, of using Iridium is it is jammable, right? So you can have a, a radio frequency jammer and you can run it and you can block all the satellite communication. And this has happened. This has happened before, uh, specifically like in a war situation. If, the government, if there's like an act of war, the government will take out all of their jammer equipment. Um, but the thing about jammers is you have to continue running them, right? Like as soon as the jammers go down, then suddenly like the internet, uh, the satellite internet works again. Uh, and the problem we had with laser internet was um, aiming the laser is really hard. <laughs> That's, other than that, laser internet's a cool idea, but yeah. Um, similar to Iridium, I think, is a, is a one web, it's got an LEO, Constellation or about to launch, um, I don't know what band they're using, KU band, mm -hmm. um, would you look at them? Yeah, so we looked at all the different satellite internet providers. There's a lot of stuff coming out, right? Like satellite internet is gonna just, it's gonna be big uh, in soon, but soon in the satellite world is like a while. Like you can't wait for satellites to launch. Like a decade, just soon. Yeah, decade. Uh, could very well wait a decade for these satellites to come online. Um, so uh, the reason we chose Iridium over the other ones, so the, uh, some of the other satellites, the problem with them is that um, you have to aim your receiver at the satellite, which we found was hard for users to figure out how to do the aiming and how to like tell if it's locked. Yeah, so like with Iridium, um, it's not perfect. The, the thing with Iridium is it needs a clear view of the open sky. So like if you're in between buildings, it's, it's just not gonna work very well. It, it still might work because as soon as the satellite comes, you know, you have a little window of time. Um, but uh, if you have a clear view of the sky, you don't have to point it. You just, you know, put it on the top of a building or something, put it on top of a parking garage, and then, and then it works. There's always an Iridium satellite above you anywhere in the world at all times. So from a usability perspective, um, some of the other satellite networks that just have the one satellite or like maybe three satellites, um, they, you know, the pricing is better, the bandwidth is higher, there's a lot of advantages, um, but uh, you know, it's ju it's come just comes down to the usability, like Iridium is like, because they have the most satellites. Okay, awesome, any more questions?
Could you maybe for the audience, since we do have a somewhat technical audience here, give a very brief dive into what the basics of hiding internet traffic consists yes, of? Yes, I would love to. So you look at the internet traffic as a filter and you look at the different qualities of the internet traffic and you say, these are qualities that are part of traffic that I don't like and these are qualities that are part of traffic that I do like. So a great example is, um, and people are surprised, but this is actually the most common way to block traffic is you look at the bytes <coughs> at the traffic you know like you know like computer data it's in bytes right you look at the first byte the second byte the third byte and you say are these bytes that i know that they represent something that is bad <coughs> so a great example is every open vpn conversation on the internet every time you open an open vpn connection the first, second, and fourth bytes are going to say, essentially, I am an open VPN connection. So it is very easy then to um, configure the filter to say, if you see a connection where the first, second, and fourth bytes are this, uh, drop it. And if they are anything else, let it through. And now you've blocked all open VPN <coughs> traffic on your whole network while only looking at three bytes. Um, and that's the most common thing. Uh, another thing that people will look at is like um, like data flows. So like for instance, if you're streaming Netflix, you can tell because you send a small little bit of request to Netflix saying, here's the show I would like to watch. And then it sends you back an hour of video data, right? So it's a very one-sided, tiny request followed by one hour. So um, you know that's a way that you can do it. One uh, very effective thing that happened once to block circumvention tools is a lot of circumvention tools like to pretend to be web traffic. They like to be like, oh, I'm loading a web page, but it's not. It's actually like a VPN and like all of your internet traffic's going through this thing that looks like it's loading a web page. So what they did in this case was they said, okay, if any uh, web page load takes more than 60 seconds, then shut it down. And that pretty much blocked all the circumvention tools in the country because um, no web request takes longer than 60 seconds. But what they were doing was they were doing this web request and then leaving it open for two hours as you put all of your internet data over this one thing that looks like a web request. So, you know, basically any thing that you can think of in terms of like a quality that internet traffic might have, there's a, a theoretical ability that you might be able to make a filter that does that. However, we're not actually fighting against general purpose computation here. We're fighting against an appliance that you buy, that you plug in, and has like a little web interface where you can check boxes on it. That's what the administrators do, right? So like they don't, they can't just write a general purpose program. That's not how these boxes work, right? They are only able to configure them within the parameters of the user interface. Um, and so uh, when you know how the boxes work and like which specific things they're looking for, then it's a lot more easy to defeat them than to think like, well, imagine if a person was looking at this and they would see this and know that it was, that it was fake. And that comes back to like my earlier point about robots is we just have to fool the device. Uh, and it's not a very sophisticated device because it's trying to do things very efficiently so it can do the internet track of traffic of the entire country in just a few of these boxes. Yeah, so, what? yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, we'll come to you in a second. Yeah. Uh, is machine learning starting to step into that sphere where they're able to better monitor the traffic that is flowing through or they're able to, uh, to, to uh, identify your workarounds a little bit faster? That's a great question. Um, so there are some papers on using machine learning to identify uh, network traffic. Uh, the problem is uh, being able to do it at scale. But we actually have a, a project that, again, thanks for introing like, you know, my projects. I don't have a slide for it. But we have a project called Adversary Lab. And what we do, so people come up with these different, we call them pluggable transports, like these different ways to hide your traffic. And a lot of times they come with them up like in an academic lab setting. They say, oh, I've got a great idea to like hide traffic like so well, like no one will ever be able to find it. Um, does it actually work? Is it, is it efficient? You know, like is it uh, effective against these devices? Um, you could uh, ship it to all of the users and you know, deploy it in the field and you could see if it gets blocked or not. That's gonna take a couple years. Um, so in Adversary Lab, what we do is we use machine learning to train a filter that acts like the filters you'll find in the real world. And then we can test these different things and see if they're effective against our machine learning trained adversary. Now, we do not release our machine learning models because we're not trying to help the adversaries get better. We try to build the strongest adversary we possibly can in the lab and then um, use it to test things so that no one deploys something which could be defeated in the lab. They don't deploy it in the field, something that's like going to be broken in like a week, right? OK, well, let's, let's wrap it up. And then you know I know there's going to be uh, drinks afterwards. And yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.
Learn more about the Operator Foundation at operatorfoundation.org. With John Lepkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney, and this is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.